Hey everyone and welcome back for another deep dive. This time uh, we're going to be looking at something that's really important for you as an early stage programmer. And that is concurrency. Yeah. Um, you know, we talk a lot about different things on the show, different technologies, different approaches, different languages. But one thing that sort of underlies all of that is that you are ultimately trying to instruct a computer to do something. Right. And the way that you instruct a computer to do something can have dramatic effects on how quickly it does it. So that's one of the reasons why concurrency is so important. That's right. And as an early stage programmer, you may not be familiar with this. And so we're going to dive deep into it today. And we've got some really interesting material to pull from. Uh, one of them is this paper that I was reading from Matt Kulakundis, who worked on Google's TC malloc memory allocator. Okay. And um, we're also going to be looking at the LMAX disruptor which is a system for handling super high-speed financial transactions. Yeah, I think those are both great examples. Um, and, you know, as you were saying, one of the things that I think is most interesting about concurrency is that there is this initial thought that you want to try and make things as parallel as possible right. to try and speed them up. Go fast. But it turns out that it's really not as simple as that. Um, and it's not always the right answer. Yeah, I was reading this analysis from Trisha Gee. And she found that a simple Java program running on a single thread actually outperformed a parallel version of the same program written in Scala wow. by a factor of four. And this was on a 16-core machine. So you've got all these cores just sitting there. And yet the single-threaded Java program was faster. Right. That's wild. And I think it really highlights how important it is to really understand the problem you're trying to solve before you jump in and try to parallelize everything. Yeah. So what are some of the things we need to be thinking about if we are going to consider, you know, going down that road and trying to make things concurrent? Well, one of the biggest problems you're going to run into is contention. Contention. And you can almost think about this like, you know, you've got a very narrow doorway and you've got this big crowd of people. Okay. And they're all trying to get through the doorway at the same time. It's gonna be very slow. Right. It's gonna be very chaotic. You're gonna be bumping into each other. Yeah. So how does that how does that translate to the world of code? Well, in computer programming terms, you've got multiple threads that are all trying to access the same resource. Okay. Like let's say they're all trying to update the same variable at the same time. And that can lead to a lot of slowdown. They're all stuck in the doorway yeah. trying to get to that variable. Right. Um and so how much of a slowdown are we talking about here? Well, there was this really interesting example by Mike Barker where he showed that a simple operation, just incrementing a counter, became 746 times slower wow. when you had two threads contending on a lock. 746 times slower just from that contention. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So clearly we need to be thinking about contention. Right. If we're designing systems for concurrency, what are some of the things that we can do to minimize that? Well, one thing you can try to do is minimize the amount of shared resources you have. Okay. If each thread has its own dedicated space to work in, then they're not going to be stepping on each other's toes as much. So it's like giving each person their own doorway. Yeah. Instead of trying to cram them all through the same one. Yeah. Okay, now what if you can't do that? What if you absolutely have to share some resources? And that's where locks come in. Okay, locks. And a lock is basically a mechanism that allows only one thread to access a shared resource at a time. So it's like a bouncer at the door. Exactly. Making sure only one person goes in at a time. Okay. So it can help prevent that chaos and ensure that the data is consistent. But of course, it also introduces some overhead. Because now you've got people waiting in line yeah. to get into the club. Right. Um, so you mentioned that locks can actually slow things down, even though their intention is to you know, kind of make things more organized. How does that happen? Well, every time a thread wants to acquire a lock, it has to make a request to the operating system. And that involves what's called a context switch, where the operating system has to pause the current thread and switch to another one. Okay. And these context switches are relatively expensive operations because it disrupts the flow of execution. So even though you're trying to keep things organized, you're introducing these new costs right. by having to switch back and forth. Okay, now, I think I remember you telling me before that there's actually another cost associated with locks too. Yeah, so modern CPUs have these things called caches, which are basically small, fast memory banks that store frequently accessed data. Okay. And when a thread acquires a lock, it often has to invalidate those caches, which forces other threads to reload that data from slower main memory. So it's kind of like every time you have a new person come to the bar, you're clearing out all the glasses and the bottles, and then you have to go back and get everything again. It, 
even if they're just ordering the same drink as the previous customer. So it's this constant overhead of having to reset everything. Right. And you were saying that this problem with locks is actually even worse in virtualized environments. Yeah. Like in cloud servers. It says in a virtualized environment, those trips to the operating system for lock management become even more expensive. Okay, so locks are kind of like this double-edged sword. You know, they're there to help us keep things organized, but they also introduce all this extra cost. Right. Um, so what can we do about that? Is there a way to coordinate these threads without having to use locks? Well, there are actually some really interesting approaches to this that address these limitations of locks. And one of them, which we'll talk about a bit more, is the LMAX disruptor. Okay, the disruptor. I'm intrigued. And instead of relying on locks... The disruptor uses a really clever data structure called a ring buffer. A ring buffer. Okay, well, let's dive into that then. So before the break, we were talking about locks. Right, those pesky locks. And all the overhead that can come with them. Yeah, so you were about to tell us about this thing called a ring buffer. The ring buffer. What is that and how does that help us with this concurrency problem? Well, a ring buffer, it's a circular data structure. Okay. Kind of like a carousel. Okay, I can picture that. So it's a fixed size. And, you know, as data is added to it, it wraps around. Okay. So when it reaches the end, it starts overwriting the oldest data. So it's like a, a loop. Yeah, continuous loop. Okay. And the really cool thing about this for concurrency is that we can have multiple threads writing to and reading from this ring buffer without those threads ever having to directly interact with each other. Okay, so we're avoiding those those doorway situations. Exactly. Where everybody's trying to crowd through the same space. Right. So how does that work? Well, the key is in how we manage the writing and the reading. Okay. So imagine you have one thread that's adding data to the ring buffer. Okay. Let's call that the producer. The producer, okay. And then you have another thread that's reading that data. Okay. We'll call that the consumer the consumer got it. So the producer only writes to a very specific location in the buffer, and that location is determined by a sequence number. Okay. And similarly, the consumer only reads from a specific location, also tracked by a sequence number. So they each have their own designated spot. Exactly. In the ring buffer. Okay, that makes so sense. So no more crowding the doorway. Everyone has their own designated spot. So how do they know where to go? Well, that's where those sequence numbers come in. Okay. They act as signals to syndicate where the producer is and where the consumer is. Okay. So the producer keeps incrementing its sequence number as it writes data, and the consumer keeps track of the producer's sequence number to know where to read from. So it's like they're following each other around the carousel. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Okay. And there are rules about how far ahead the producer can get to make sure that it doesn't overwrite data that the consumer hasn't processed yet. So they don't bump into each other. Exactly. Okay, it's all starting to click now. So this ring buffer idea, Seems pretty clever. It is. And you mentioned that it can lead to some pretty impressive performance gains. Absolutely. You said something about the LMAX disruptor, being able to handle millions of transactions per second. Yeah, the LMAX disruptor is a really great example of the in action. It can handle millions of transactions per second with incredibly low latency. Wow. Millions per second. That's pretty amazing. But it's not just about the ring buffer itself. There's mm -hmm. a lot of other things going on under the hood that contribute to that performance. So what else are they doing? Well, they've really embraced this idea of mechanical sympathy. Mechanical sympathy? Which we touched on a little bit earlier. Right, that was about understanding how the hardware works. Exactly. And kind of working with the hardware. It's about understanding how the CPU works, how the memory works, how the caches work, and then writing your code in a way that takes advantage of those things Okay. rather than working against them. So what are some examples of that? Well, one example is pre-allocating memory. So instead of constantly allocating and deallocating memory, which can be very expensive, the disruptor allocates a big chunk of memory up front and then just reuses that memory over and over again. Okay, so that avoids all those garbage collection pauses exactly. that we talked about before. And then they also very carefully organize the data in memory Okay. to make sure that related pieces of information are stored close together. And this improves cache locality, which means the CPU can find and access the data more efficiently. So it's like arranging your workspace so that all the tools you need are within easy reach. Yeah, that's a good analogy. Okay, so there's a lot of really clever optimizations going on here. There are a lot of subtle things that can make a big difference. And are there other ways to achieve this kind of performance? Or is the disruptor kind of the, the only game in town? Well, the disruptor is a great example of lock-free concurrency, but it's certainly not the only approach. Okay. There are other patterns and techniques out there, like lock-free queues, compare and swap operations, atomic variables. All these things can be used. 
to achieve similar results. So it's about choosing the right tool for the job. Exactly. Okay. And, you know, the disruptor, it excels in certain scenarios, like when you have a single producer and multiple consumers processing data in a pipeline. But for other use cases, different approaches might be more appropriate. Right. It's like having different tools in your toolbox. Exactly. Okay. And choosing the right tool requires understanding the strengths and weaknesses of each one. So it sounds like concurrency is a pretty complex and constantly evolving field. Yeah, it definitely is. How do you even keep up with all of this? Well, I think a good starting point is to understand the fundamental concepts. Okay. Like threads, processes, synchronization mechanisms, the different concurrency models. Okay. And once you have a good grasp of those, you can start diving deeper into the specific libraries and frameworks that are relevant to the language you're working with. So what are some good resources for learning about these things? Well, there are some great books out there like Java Concurrency in Practice by Brian Gertz. Okay, Java Concurrency in Practice. And The Art of Multiprocessor Programming by Maurice Herlihy and Nir Shavit. Okay. And of course, there's a lot of great information on the LMAX Disruptor website. Okay, we'll be sure to include links to those in the show notes. Now, before we move on, I wanted to circle back to something we mentioned earlier. Okay. TC Malloc. Oh, yeah. Google's memory allocator. Exactly. What does that have to do with concurrency? Well, it's a really good example of a even a low level system like a memory allocator can benefit from careful concurrency design. So even something as fundamental as allocating memory needs to be designed with concurrency in mind. Yeah, because memory allocation, it happens all the time in any program. And if you've got multiple threads all trying to allocate memory at the same time, that can lead to contention and slow things down. Right, it's like everybody trying to grab the same piece of cake. Exactly. Exactly. And Matt Kulakundis, who worked on refactoring TC Malik, he had to tackle some really interesting concurrency challenges. Okay, like what? Well, one of the biggest ones was isolating components for testing. Okay. Which is really important for making sure that your concurrent code is correct. But it can be really tricky in a system as complex as a memory allocator. Right, because everything's so intertwined. Exactly. And you mentioned that he also had to deal with something called the ABA problem. Yeah, the ABA problem. It's a classic concurrency bug. Okay, I've never heard of that one. What is it? So imagine you have a thread that reads a value. Let's say it's A. A. And then that thread gets interrupted for a while. Maybe it goes to sleep. Meanwhile, another thread comes along and changes that value to B. Okay, so it goes from A to B. And then changes it back to A again. Oh, so it goes A to B, back to A, and then the first thread wakes up, sees that the value is A, and thinks nothing has changed. Right. But in reality, it's a different A. Yeah, it's like someone swapped out your coffee cup while you weren't looking. But it still looks like your coffee cup. Exactly. That is devious. And it can lead to some very subtle and nasty bugs. So how do you fix that? Well, Kulakundis came up with this really clever solution. He used extra bits in pointers okay. to store information about the history of a memory location. So he's keeping track of the changes. Yeah. Okay. And that allows him to detect those fake A values. Wow, that is some next level thinking. So it seems like we've only just scratched the surface. Well, yeah, we've barely begun to explore all the nuances of concurrent programming. Okay. But I think it's important to remember that even though it can be complex, it's also incredibly rewarding. And the skills you gain along the way will serve you well throughout your programming career. Okay, so we've talked about these locks and we've talked about ring buffers. And then you even brought up this TC Malik, which was fascinating. Um, and it seems like one of the big takeaways, for me at least, is this idea of balance. Yeah. You know, we're always trying to balance simplicity with performance, maintainability with, you know, efficiency. Um, and it seems like concurrency is kind of all about making these choices. Right. And finding the right approach for the problem that you're trying to solve. There's no silver bullet. There's no one size fits all. Exactly. It's like navigating the complex landscape. You know, you might need a different vehicle, depending on whether you're driving on a smooth highway or a bunky dirt road or, you know, venturing off road altogether. Right. Now, for an early stage programmer, this can all seem a little bit overwhelming. It can be a lot to take in. What advice would you give to someone who's just starting out on their concurrency journey? I think the most important thing is to not be afraid to experiment, Okay. make mistakes. Concurrency can be challenging, but it's also incredibly rewarding. So don't get discouraged. Exactly. Where should they start then? Well, I would say start with the fundamentals. Okay. Learn about threads and processes and basic synchronization mechanisms. So it's like learning to walk before you can run. 
Exactly. And where can they go to, to learn about those fundamentals? Well, you mentioned some good resources earlier, like the Java Concurrency and Practice book uh -huh. and the Art of Multiprocessor Programming book. Right. Those are great places to start. And there are also lots of online courses and tutorials available. Okay. And of course, don't be afraid to reach out to the community. Right. There are lots of people out there who are passionate about concurrency and are happy to help. It's like having a group of experienced hikers to guide you along the trail. Exactly. Any other advice? As you gain experience, always be mindful of the trade-offs. Okay. Think about the performance implications of your choices, but also think about the maintainability of your code. Right. We don't want to create code that's so clever that nobody can understand it, right. including ourselves six months down the line. And most importantly, never stop learning. Okay. The world of concurrency is constantly evolving. There are always new tools and techniques and challenges emerging. So stay curious. Keep exploring. It's well, this has been a fantastic deep dive. I've learned so much about concurrency, and I hope our listeners have too. I hope so. So until yeah. next time, happy coding, everyone. Happy coding.